Welcome to this episode of Your Lifestyle is Your Medicine. Today we have Liam Naden as my guest. Now, Liam is a native New Zealander who spent years traveling around the world on boats and yachts whilst discovering a simple truth about our brains. He's going to share with us today about how we're actually using our brains incorrectly, that when we use them correctly, we can actually get rid of fear and the state of fear that 98% of the world lives in and allow our brain to be more creative and build us the life that we want. Liam is a researcher, an author, a podcaster, and a speaker. He's developed neurostate rebalancing. And that's what we're going to get into today. We're going to learn about his journey, how he went from being a multimillionaire to sleeping on his mother's couch at the age of 43, and then what he did to discover how he was using his brain incorrectly and ultimately create neurostate rebalancing. So this is a very cool podcast, something different that I haven't done before, but we're going to find out exactly how to use our brains. Liam, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about your journey, uh, what you've developed with neurostate rebalancing, your work with the brain and, and how you help people. So welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Ed. Thanks very much for having me on your show. Oh, thank you. So I would like to put things into context for my listeners. And before we get into what you've developed and how you help people, maybe you could describe a little bit of your journey and how you came to develop the neurostate rebalancing. Sure. Well, I've spent pretty, mu pretty much all of my life with the burning question, how can I be the best that I can be? How can I be successful? How can I be happy? How can I be rich and famous? Well, I didn't really want to be rich and famous, but the rich sounds quite good. Yes. So I've always been consumed by this this idea, this question, and I've I've really searched in all sorts of different directions. I was brought up a, in a in a Christian family, so the first thing I did was explore what the church teaches about how to be happy and successful. And of course, the message there is very clear: if you want to be happy or if you want to have something, you just ask God. You pray. You tell God what you want. You pray for it, and God will give it to you. Now, that didn't quite work out for me too well in the right. sense that I didn't really get everything I prayed for. And I'm sure everyone said that experience. So I thought maybe that's not all that's not really quite the answer. But I moved on to lots of other things. And in the process, I became an entrepreneur and I set up my own businesses. Um, I've had 18 different businesses in my life. Wow. And uh, because, of course, one of the ideas I picked up is the key to be happy and successful is to have your own business and make lots of money. Mm -hmm. So I tried all that, that as well. But along the way, when I was developing these various businesses, I was also studying, again, success. So I was doing everything in, from personal development and self-help to spirituality, studying psychology, not in any professional way, but mm -hmm. in an in a interested way. And all of these different things, you know, I was the one who, I... I I went to lots of seminars. I went all around the world to seminars and I read books and I did courses and I listened to all sorts of, you know, subliminal hypnotic right. suggestion type things, working on how to set goals and how to change your beliefs and how to reprogram your subconscious mind. So I did all of these things and I studied meditation and spiritual practices. But what I noticed through all of them were all of my life, if you like, were a couple of interesting things. Firstly, everything that I studied, although it had some good ideas, it didn't seem to be quite the answer. Mm -hmm. Because I looked around me and I thought, the people here aren't different to anyone else in the world. In this group who are studying this particular person's seminar or mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know, they're not standing out as particularly special. They've still got problems and they're not really achieving everything they want to Anyway, and all the goal setting workshops and things that I studied, again, people weren't getting what I thought were good enough results. Mm. And I wasn't either. And although I had a lot of external success on one level, you know, I, was a, I became a multimillionaire wow. through my businesses and I had homes and, and, and things, and it was all good. But I had lots of problems and stress in my life. And I was continually dealing with this feeling that I wasn't really in control of my life. I wasn't really living to my potential. And I kept thinking, I need to do another course. I need to do read another book. 
I need to work harder on my subconscious mm-hmm. mind and my positive thinking and all of those sorts of things. Well, so let that's me what just I can interrupt you there for a second. What what was it that you felt like you were missing? I mean, your story so far sounds like a story that many people can relate to. You know, it's it's like you want to be successful, wealthy, happy. Uh, and wise, but you seem to have got the wealth. You mentioned you're a multimillionaire. You had the businesses. So, what was missing? What was driving you to keep learning? What was missing was really being happy and really right. feeling that I was in control of my life. Because I was starting to think what I had read that in several books and what many people were saying, which mm-hmm. was success comes at a price, and that price is problems and stress. You have to learn if you want to be successful. And stay successful, you have to learn how to deal with stress and problems. And you have to always be overcoming challenges mm-hmm. and breaking through problems and all that sort of thing. And so, although I was successful on the outside, what true success came to mean for me and what I realized it actually is, is actually being happy, is yes. feeling good, is feeling in control of your life. And that wasn't really coming with all of the, you know, all of the books I was reading and, and everything else. And I, I'm not even sure if how much of that really contributed directly to my outward success either. Mm-hmm. But that's the thing. And that's what we're all looking for is to feel good. And it turns out that feeling good not only is what we want, it's what we're actually designed to be. Mm-hmm. Because biologically, we're designed to feel good. And I can talk about how I discovered that and how that relates to the brain and who we are. Yeah. But anyway, that's the thing. So I w- that's what continually drove me to want to make more money, set higher goals, do more courses, learn more things, work harder at everything that I was doing. And it felt that I was just chasing after success. And no matter what I did, I never quite really grasped this feeling of relief and satisfaction and, and thrill, you know, apart from in brief moments about mm-hmm. my life. Mm-hmm. But anyway, what really happened, the most interesting thing <clears throat> for me, <laughs> if you like, right. was that in my mid-40s, I had all this knowledge and I had all this success. I had the homes and the money and everything else. But then almost overnight, I lost everything. I literally went from multimillionaire to homeless with nothing. How did that happen? And I had, Well, it's a combination of um, bad decisions right. that I'd made personally and in business. And they all sort of came to a head all at once without getting into too much of the mm-hmm. the detail for perhaps legal reasons. <laughs> I okay. don't know. But um, but it was a culmination of some decisions that I'd made and, and, and things just all went wrong at once, if you like. But I, I literally was homeless. I had to move in with my elderly mother who had a small apartment, small flat, and I had to sleep on the on the couch in her living room. And I thought how could this have happened to me? Because I thought I knew how to be successful. I've read all the books on Mm -hmm. goal setting. I know how to, how to set the right goals and be accurate. I know how to use affirmations. I know how to reprogram my thoughts and be a positive thinker and try all that and meditate and and try all these, the law of attraction and all these different things. I had all this knowledge, but it wasn't on my goals list to lose everything. And it certainly didn't make me feel any better or in control of my life. In fact, I felt, terrible and totally out of control because it was like this was happening to me without me having any any say in it at all really what was going on and you you were married as well weren't you yes and all that went you lost your, so you lost your marriage it. your businesses your homes like everything everything i was left literally with the clothes on my back that was it wow and a, and an old car that i managed to scrape together wow enough okay. money to buy so yeah, yeah. You're in your you're in your mid forties. You're living on your mum's couch, not feeling. I'm guessing not feeling too great about yourself because of all the self development no. work that you've done in the past. It 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 hadn't worked for you, or maybe it had worked for you. But we'll, we'll, we can, we'll get into that maybe a bit later. Okay. So so what happened? How did you how did you pick yourself up from that situation? Well, that was a really interesting thing. How did I pick myself mm. up from that situation? I didn't really know at the time, but what actually happened was I did get through the the whole stress and and problems and sort everything out and then come out the other side. And I started to to develop new businesses, came up with new business ideas, new business opportunities came along. So I started to rebuild my life as an entrepreneur with with various businesses. 
several of which I still, or a couple of which I still have now, or or that I've developed since that I still have, I should say. Mm. Um, but what I noticed the difference was I was starting to really enjoy my life. I was starting to do things that I really liked to do. I was starting to earn all of the money I needed and wanted, really, to do what I wanted to do, to travel and do things that I really enjoyed doing. But the best part of all was I didn't have any stress. I didn't have any problems. And I actually started to feel what I'd always wanted to feel, which was happy and being in control of my life. You know, I actually was able to wake up in the morning excited about the day rather than dreading opening my email inbox, which is what I used to do. Wow. And I used to go to bed at night. And I say used to, I still do. <laughs> go to bed at night going, wow, that was great what happened today. It was really interesting. And wonder what's going to happen tomorrow and, and be excited about life. Yeah. So I thought to myself, I need to figure out what I'm doing differently because I've got all of this knowledge, all of this information, and somehow it didn't work for me either because I still felt stressed and unhappy and also because I lost everything. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, instead of before I was chasing success, I was always after what's the next goal? Where's the next opportunity? How can I make more? How can I be more, do more? What? How can I learn more? All of that stuff with all the stress and pressure that it came with it. It was very different because it was like success was coming to me in a strange sort of way. So I'd meet people that I hadn't seen for a long time or whatever, and they'd say, hey, Liam, here's an opportunity. Why don't you do that? And I'd say, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I took the opportunity, and it worked out really well. Or I'd come up with an idea, or I'd be in a situation, and and things just seemed to flow a lot better and sort of slot together in, in, the, in the right sort of way. And, of course, I was still, and this is me still, I should say, I was still working really hard or working mm -hmm. hard, but but I was – enjoying it. I wasn't being stressed. You know, there's a difference between struggle and effort. I was putting in effort, not struggle. And I was being a lot more productive. You mentioned I've, pr I've produced a lot of books and programs mm -hmm. and yeah, courses. Yeah. You know, all of these things were just sort of coming out of me and the right things were happening. So I said, I need to figure out what's going on because I don't want to mess this up. This is working, whatever it is. I'm actually feeling like my life has a purpose mm -hmm. and, and it's working. So that's what really led me to investigate an area I'd never really looked at before, which is the brain. And how I got onto that was my new life I spent quite, and I still do spend a lot more time in nature. And it suddenly occurred to me one day, I looked around closely at nature and very few of us ever do that. We don't spend five minutes, let alone one minute, just observing a bird or a plant or an insect and really looking at what's going on. But what you see in nature is that everything is actually perfect. Mm -hmm. Everything works really well. In fact, someone described it recently, I read, and they said nature has a 98% success rate and a 2% failure rate. And what that means is 98% of nature is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's, it's surviving and thriving. And only 2% fails where you know a tree might be planted in the wrong place by accident and falls over or there's a right. storm or a drought or something. <clears throat> but I thought, so what's nature doing? This is really interesting because I suddenly realized we're part of nature. Whoever we think we are, we're also biological. We've got a biological body. We are a life form. We exist in a living world mm -hmm. of life forms. So there must be something that either a purpose to this whole physical living existence world, if you like, and it also must operate in a certain way for everything to, to look like it's working so well. And um, that's when I realized, of course, I, I, I thought, well, I wonder what, bio, what biological science says about the purpose of life. Does life have a purpose? Do we have a purpose for being here biologically? And they all, all of biological science will tell you, yes, there is a purpose to life. One fundamental purpose, and it is to survive mm -hmm. and to thrive. That is why the, the main function, wiring purpose of everything alive is to strive to be alive and to survive. And the way it does that, of course, as you see in nature, is it does its best to be the best that it can be so that it has the greatest chance of survival. That's how everything is wired. Everything is designed to give itself the greatest chance to survive. That's its biological purpose. And of course, for humans, as I realized, 
being the best that we can be also means the best that we can be mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. That means being our happiest. And it turns out biologically when we are our happiest, that's when we are at our best. That's when we have the greatest chance for survival. Both we're better physically when we're happy. Our bodies respond much better to, to you know, disease, infection, um, danger, all those sorts yeah. of things. But also we're more resourceful. We do, the, do better things. We're more creative. We're more loving. We, we contribute a lot more when we're feeling good. So it turns out that biologically, this is all in, in total um, agreement with what our biology is and what all of nature is. We're biologically designed to strive to be the best that we can be. And mm -hmm. I thought, right, well, that's clear. That's great. So that's my purpose is to be the best that I can be. And then I thought, well, how do I do that? How does nature do that? Because there must be some mechanism or system or you know, set of rules or, or something that, that enables everything to be the, to strive to be the best that it can be. And of course, it turns out there is, and it's staring us in the face, really, because every single living thing has been provided with a machine whose sole purpose is to make sure it has the greatest chance of survival by being the best that it can be. And that machine is a brain. Everything, including us, has a brain, which is just a machine biologically designed to to strive and ensure that that organism that is the best that it can be. And to throw in a, a biological word, science has a word for this. It's called homeostasis. Yeah. Homeostasis is the optimal functioning of the organism, which means being the best that it can be, which is the purpose of all life. And it's the purpose of the brain of every organism to achieve that state. So I thought, well, this is great. So, okay, so the brain is a machine designed to make me the best that I can be. Why am I not the best that I can be? Because the same people who've discovered that that biological life is 98% successful has also discovered and said that humans are 98% unsuccessful. Yeah. There's only two, a 2% success rate in the human species. Only 2% of people are truly happy. 98% of people are struggling with problems, stress, and feeling like I used to feel way below mm -hmm. their real potential. And I thought, what can the difference be? Why can the rest of nature work so well with a 98% success rate, everything being the best that it can be? And here we are, us poor humans, we've got a 2% success rate, and we're not being the best that we can be. It can only come down to one thing. The machine that we've been given to ensure that we're not using it the right way. Because when you think about any machine, a good example is a motor car. A motor car is a machine that has a very specific purpose. It's designed to get you from where you are to where you want to go. That's all it does. That's what it's designed to do. And it will do it efficiently, reliably, effectively, and very enjoyably and comfortably for you, the passenger or the, or the driver, right. on the journey. But if you don't drive it right, or if you don't know how to drive it, what's going to happen? You're going to end up with problems. You're not going to, it's not going to do its job properly. You know, if you put the wrong fuel in, it's not going to work. If you think to yourself, I don't know how to drive this car. No one's ever shown me or taught me. Um, and I've got no clue how to do it. But or maybe the answer is to get out from behind and push. So I'll put in, I'll get out from behind because mm. I see it's got wheels. And I'll put in all of this enormous energy and effort and determination. And I'll give myself lots of positive thinking. And I'll try and push the car to the destination. Yeah. And what's going to happen? You're just going to get exhausted. It's not going to work. And you, then you might say in your ignorance, oh, the problem is me. I'm not trying hard enough. I'm not uh, determined enough. I'm not motivated enough. I'm still telling myself the wrong things. I need to try, and e try harder. And, of course, someone else comes along and says, what on earth are you doing? You're making it too hard for yourself. You're creating all these problems for yourself when all you need to do is to realize that, it's, that you just know how to drive it. You just know how to use it. And then it's going to do its job for you without you doing all the struggle. Hmm. Interesting. So these so, talk, this is oh. where, Sorry to I'm just going to say this is what this... Led, led me into all of the brain stuff and to realize this is fundamental. This is biological. We've all been taught, told the wrong stuff about who we are and how we get the results we do in our life. And we need to understand this stuff because it's actually taught in the Bible without us, but we haven't interpreted it the right way. But it's very plain once you start looking in the Bible, how clear it is. We've been taught in every spiritual tradition, psychology, philosophy, all teach 
how to use your brain in different ways, but it's the same message, but we still haven't got it because we're still struggling with problems and stress, most of us, mm -hmm. to the point we think it's natural. We think problems and stress are an inevitable part of life. Biologically, they're not. There's no stress and problems in the rest of nature. And how does stress and problems help you be the best that you can be? They don't. They do the opposite. They harm you physically. If you're stressed, science is coming to realize that virtually all disease is caused by stress. Mm -hmm. It's damaging to your body. And it's not making you creative, productive, and resourceful and helping other people and yourself create a better life. That's not what problems and stress do. So they can't be biologically natural. It can only be like every machine that's used the wrong way. And that's what shows up. Mm -hmm. And that is the truth. Fascinating. So did you come to this conclusion yourself or did you get inspiration from somewhere that, that because you pointed out that it is actually in religion or, or even, you know, when you're talking, I'm thinking about Buddhism, that you know, suffering but it's the it's the interpretation of suffering you know it's like there's always going to be things happening but they don't need you don't need to have a stress response to those things um did you do you come to that by yourself and i mean i'm summarizing something slightly different obviously but did you come to that by yourself or did you get inspiration from somewhere well i really pulled it all together myself because when i started to look at this biological aspect to who we are mm. which really drives everything nature drives everything i mean you i i know i get it that we're all spiritual beings but we're here having a physical experience mm. and so the physical drives everything you walk off a cliff you're going to go down the law of gravity it doesn't matter what you think that's going to happen the same with our you know everything about our physical life but what I realized once I started to get into this is I thought a lot of um, science, you know, bio, biology, brain science, they all had strands of these um, of, of, what, of what the truth was. But I, I, I really pulled it, pulled it together from a, different, a lot of different places. There was nobody I could say, oh, I read this book and this right. is what I believe. Yeah. I really pulled all these ideas together from, from science because, you know, one of the problems with specialization is people tend to be very good at one thing, but joining all the dots is not yeah. so easy. And that's what I've really, because I've done so many, studied so many different things and experienced so many different things, I, I felt I was able to pull the dot, dots together into something which really explained what happened to me and also explains what happens to other people when I when I help them with this, mm -hmm. with this understanding. It's brilliant. Okay, this is exciting. So this is a truly new um, concept that you've, you're the creator of it. And I really want to get into what is what is it that you developed? Um, and I think it's the neurostate rebalancing, but it may be a few other things before that. I mean, you tell me. Well, just like with a car, the beauty is once you understand how your brain works, you're pretty well guaranteed to start using it the right way. It's like with a car. You don't, and you, you know, you know, well, this is what you do. You don't have the, the um, brake and the accelerator on at the same time. It's not going mm -hmm. to work. So... Probably the most useful thing I could just share with you and your listeners, the model of how your brain works. Um, because, and what I've done with that, I've created a model which is quite simple to understand. It's not full of technical jargon. It's backed up by all the scientific words and, and explanations. But just like with a car, you know, I, I, you don't need to know the name of every little wire and what it does. Right. You just need to know the basically how to use it. So, and And then that will explain, I think, a lot about... Uh, people, I think, when they hear that, are going to go, I know now what I'm doing wrong. And I, at least I know what I should be doing. The, the answer to what you should be doing is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? That sounds great. Let's go. Okay. So essentially your brain, and we're talking about a physical thing here, not, not ideas. This isn't about your mind, your subconscious, all those concepts you might have heard of. The physical biological brain that you have, which is the sole, whose sole purpose is to ensure that you have the greatest chance for survival by being the best that you can be, essentially has four parts. Mm -hmm. And these are all physical locations, separate physical locations in your brain that look after different processes. The first part is what I call the thinking brain. And the thinking brain, which is located on the top of the head, mm -hmm. this, what this does is, is it draws, literally draws all of the information that you take in in every moment of your life so everything that comes in from your five senses, what you hear, smell, taste, touch, see, ideas, thoughts, experiences through your five senses, 
all comes into this part of your brain and it's stored there in a basically a library or a database. So this is this is a library of all of the information that you've gathered in your life. This is stored in the thinking brain. Right. The second part of your brain is the emotional brain or the feeling brain, which is located just below your thinking brain. And as the name suggests, this is the part that directs your how you feel, your emotions, everything from feeling loving, happy, great, to feeling terrible, <laughs> you know, afraid, worried, stressed. This is all managed and directed by your emotional brain. The third part of the brain, at the back of the head, actually, is called the survival brain. And the survival brain, again, the name's pretty obvious, this is responsible for everything to do with keeping you alive in every moment. So it looks after all of the automatic functions, like your breathing, heart rate, all of the organs, all of the physical process, processes that keep you alive. So that's really important, obviously. But there's one other thing that the survival brain does, which is part of our survival, and that is it creates a response to any immediate threat or danger that you might face to your survival. So, for instance, you know, the classic um, example is probably in prehistoric times, they're walking through the forest and a lion jumps out at the the tribe's people. So what do you do when a lion jumps out? Well, your survival brain is there to deal with that. And what it does is it activates something called your sympathetic nervous system, and it draws all of the energy that it can from the rest of your body, including the rest of your brain, to to react to that immediate threat or danger. So if it's the lion, for instance, it's going to have you shouting for help or running away or standing to fight, whatever it is. So we all know this. We know this is called the fight, flight, freeze um, instinct response. Okay, that's another... So this is a react. This is a, um, a tool and a mechanism that's provided by your survival brain to deal with any situation that's a threat to your immediate survival or could, that could harm you. But the really interesting thing about that, and we'll co- I'll come back to that because that's the part that gets one of the parts that gets used the wrong way. Because what's that? What that is designed to do is to deal with an immediate threat to your survival. But we're not faced with many immediate threats to our survival these days. We might have been 20 million years ago when the lions were wandering around in the forest, but we're not dealing with that now. But anyway, I'll come back to that. But that's all to do with the survival brain. Now, the fourth part of your brain is what I call the creative brain. And science has only more recently discovered that there are separate parts of your brain that deal with this specific sort of functioning. But actually, this is the part of your brain that's supposed to run the show. Right. When you are being the best that you can be, when your brain is working the right way, bringing to you everything you need to make you and striving to give you the experience so that you're the best that you can be, what's happening is you're running on your creative brain. Your creative brain is what's responsible, as the name suggests, for your creativity. It's where you come up with new ideas. It's where musicians and composers say, I just heard the music and I wrote it down. I don't know where it came from. I didn't, I didn't think it. It's not really me. Mm-hmm. This is the creative brain at work. It's also where your imagination comes from. It's where your motivation comes from. It's where you feel inspired to do things and you do it. It's where your gut feelings, your, your inner voice of wisdom, if you like, says, oh, that sounds like a good idea mm-hmm. or mm, don't think that does sound like a good idea. You know, that little voice we talk about sometimes. Yeah. That's all comes from your creative brain. So you're, so when you're in this state, when you're using your brain the right way, this is the part that's running your life. This is the part that's getting you to make the right decisions. This is the part that's getting you to come up with the best ideas for you to make your life the best. This is the part that's also bringing to you the right people in the right situations and circumstances that are going to enable you to be your best. Because one of the things when you're living your, using your creative brain is your awareness is much more expanded than when you're not in the state. So you can see the truth and you realize and you see clearly that anything that we would otherwise call luck, coincidence, synchronicity, chance events, they're not that at all. They're only, it's only from a limited, very limited awareness that we would think that those things are what we call them. Mm-hmm. When we, with our creative brain, we know our creative brain has the ability to bring to us the right environment as well. We can only see that when we're using our creative brain, but it is the truth. So here's the deal. This is why you're supposed to live. You're supposed to live feeling really good because remember, that's being the best that you can be. Right. It's feeling happy. And you unlock your creative brain. 
You're making the right decisions. The right people are showing up in your life. You're avoiding making the wrong decisions. You're coming up, as I said, with right ideas. You're doing all this great stuff. Sometimes it's been described as being in the flow, being in the zone, mm -hmm. or um, spiritual traditions like Buddhism talk about enlightenment. Right. This is all part of using your creative brain and allowing it to direct your life. But there's only one time you're not that that's not where you're supposed to be running your life from, and that's when the lion runs out from the behind the rock. And what happens there is your brain recognizes, it's actually your emotional brain that makes the decision and says, immediate threat or danger, warning signal. And it sends out a warning signal in the form of chemicals that create fear mm -hmm. in your life. And when you feel fear, you activate your sympathetic nervous system and the, the survival brain says, we've got to react to a danger here. So it takes all of the resources from the rest of your brain, as we said, and your body to get rid of, to deal with what it thinks is an immediate threat or danger to your survival. But in taking away the resources from the rest of your brain, because your brain uses a third of the energy of your body, so it needs all the, a lot of energy from that. Yeah. What does your survival brain do when you feel fear? It shuts down your creative brain. So all of the resources that you have to create your ideal life, to know what your ideal goals should be, what you should be doing in any moment, making the right decisions, solving any problems, that's all blocked off to you. Because you're using your survival brain, that, that that's doesn't it's shut all that down. That's of no use to deal with the lion running at you, coming up with all that stuff. It needs that energy. Mm -hmm. And what's and you can see where this is leading. Ninety eight percent of the people are living in a state of fear, worry, stress, anxiety, and they're trying to run their life from that place. But that's they're running their life in their survival brain. Their survival brain's not designed to do that. Their survival brain is looking out for the lions everywhere to, to react against it. It's not there to so that you can get rid of the lions and go back to being in your natural creative state. So you can't do that. So what's the answer? The answer is very simple. If you want to use your brain the right way, you have to stop activating fear, except when the lion really is about to eat you. Fear is the enemy. Fear is the toxin. Fear is the poison that blocks off your ability to access the part of your brain that is designed to make you the best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And it does say this in the Bible, actually, because more than 360 times in the Bible, it says, be not afraid, have no fear, trust, right. believe, have faith. But that phrase, be not afraid, is used more than 360 times in the Bible on its own. Someone counted. Hmm. And it doesn't say... Try not to worry so much. Don't be, a, you know, it's an instruction. Yeah. It's like a car manual. This is how you drive your brain. You don't be afraid, except when the lion's about to eat mm -hmm. you. And it also says, give no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Do not worry about what you should eat, drink, or wear. That will all be provided for you, as it is provided for the rest of nature. It's going to be provided for you. Mm -hmm. But if you worry, if you get stressed, if you put things into your life that make you feel bad, you're finished mm -hmm. because you, you you immediately activate your sympathetic nervous system and block off the part of you that's designed to run your life. And that's what I discovered was the difference between my life. Before, when I was all stressed, I was operating on fear. I was always worried about I didn't have enough money or I needed more money or I needed to be better or I needed to have whatever whatever it was. And I didn't realize that I all the resources that really knew how to make me happy and to give me the things that really would make me happy, I was blocking off my access to it. And that's that's where all the problems came from. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And so I'm listening to you talk there. I feel like we as humans have a problem because there's that, there's the, the fight or flight aspects of our brain, the fear response. I've heard it um, talked about as it's primed for spotting danger. And so the new cycles will play on the fear response. The uh, any, any type of sales plays on the scarcity response and so on, because it's very easy to, for it to be triggered because it's part of our evolution was to sort of scan the scan the environment and something that didn't look right, we might need to react to. Is, is that something that you've come across as well, that there's, there's that society plays because, on it? You know, Someone said to me recently, the most highly paid neuroscientists in the world work for major corporations. Mm. 
<laughs> they know how the brain works and they know that when you activate fear in somebody, lots of things happen. Firstly, their awareness is shut down. Secondly, they only see problems in the world because if you think about it, if a lion's attacking you, your brain is saying, I've, I've got to look out for every single danger that is a threat to me right now. What else, how big's the lion? How far away is it? What's Is there anything else? Is there yeah. a snake in the grass? Are there What's more that lions? Noise? Yeah. Are there more lions? So your brain is designed to do that when you're in a fear state so that it can get rid of every danger because if it misses one, you could be dead. But exactly, if, if, if people know how to... Um, how to manipulate or control people, the way you do it is through fear because it gives you a very limited awareness. It can it makes you think that you're this weak person. It doesn't make you realize you're, you've got a creative brain that's designed to make you like the rest of nature, being, being the greatest and best you can be and bring to you all the right circumstances and give you the right ideas. You don't realize that. You think you're some weak thing that's just got to fight, this, fight against a lion. It also makes, there's lots of things that, that your brain does to you when you're in that state. It makes you very open to authority. Or if somebody comes along and tells mm. you they have the answer, when you're in that state, you believe them and you accept it. And we see this, people doing completely irrational things because some government or somebody, without getting too much into you know, yep, politics being controversial, <laughs> yep. um, but the, it's the same with marketing. Marketing is designed to say, you won't, you can't be happy unless you have my product. So they make you feel bad, so that you you know, but you'll feel good when you've got whatever I'm selling you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is all um, very well understood by um, people who who like to you know manage human behaviour, if you like. Mm -hmm. But as a result, we're all living way below our potential, and we we just don't realise that that fear is the enemy. Fear is the problem. Okay, and so you've, so you've that eloquently your question. They did, and you've eloquently uh, uh, established the problem. How so highlights the problem and what's the solution? The solution, there's three solutions. Okay. And I teach this in my coaching program just to mention that. But mm. the first one is to understand how the brain works. And I hope I've given people enough of an understanding to realize that this is how you, you can't make it work if you feel afraid. That's it. It's a bit like if someone came along to you and said, I've got this new mixture for fuel for your car. It's half water and half um, orange juice and a bit of petrol in it, and you say, well, hang on, that, that's not going to work. That's not going to drive the car. And they say, what are you talking about? And you say, I understand how a car works. It won't run on that fuel. It's, it's not going to It'll have problems. It'll stutter and maybe mm. blow up the engine. And, and they say to you, oh, but everyone else, you know, everyone's looking at this new fuel and thinking it's really good. And if you have any doubts, just believe, have faith, really have positive thinking, and it'll work. You go, look, I'm sorry. Mm. It doesn't matter the justification. Whatever you say, I know it won't work. And that's the same with um, when you understand how your brain works. And that leads, so that's the first thing. You automatically know if fear is the enemy. Mm -hmm. If fear is, is going to make me not work properly, then I've got to do whatever I can to get rid of fear out of my life. And that's the second thing. You you become very aware of what is coming into your life that's making you feel bad, worried, stressed, and anxious. Is it that TV show you watch or not show, program and news mm -hmm. or whatever? Is that making you feel bad? Is that conversation? Is it that person? Is it that employee who's not performing well? Is it the job you're in that you don't like? Is it the whatever relationship that you're in is not working? If it's making you feel bad, you've got to realize that is the problem. And you've and we do have a choice. We can switch off that what what we're watching. We can end that conversation. We can even end that relationship. We can you know, let that employee go. We can find another job. We can end that. We can close that part of the business that isn't working right for us, because if it's making feel bad, it's not part of our our destiny to be the best that we can be. Mm -hmm. It simply isn't, and that's what's at stake. And when you realise that again, you become more and more mindful and say, whatever it takes, I've got to get rid of the things that are making me feel bad. And I, as I say, turn it off get you know don't spend as much time with that person change the subject whatever mm. it is that it's going to prevent you on a physical level so that's the second thing you need to do now the third thing you need to do <clears throat> once you've really and the trouble for most people is we don't realize just what is coming into us that's making us feel bad right. because fear is the basis but stress worry anxiety they're all they're all dimensions of fear they all have fear as their underlying 
basis. Mm -hmm. So the third thing we need to do, once we've stopped the bad fuel coming in, we need to look at what's already there. And I have a process you mentioned, neurostate rebalancing, mm -hmm. which helps your brain to see the difference between what's a real lion. In other words, I mean, you still want to feel afraid when if something's going to come at you and hurt you. That's its purpose. But you want to separate, get your brain to see the difference between that and something that's not going to harm you. Because all of your conditioning, all through your life, you've been teaching your brain to think that you live in a dangerous world that's full of lions. It's like driving your car and there's imaginary lion, there's lions jumping out at you all over the place. They're not actually there, but you think they are. And what do you do? You keep slamming on the brakes and driving erratically. And it's a, a stressful journey and you're, you're probably damaging the car along the way. But none of it's real. It's just what you think. Yeah. And this is what you have to retrain your brain to see is that all of these things are not a threat to your survival. And how I learned this was when I lost everything, I realized that I was driven all my life by two fears, the fear of losing everything, having nothing. And that's what continually drove me to try and make more money and do more mm -hmm. things. I was always worried subconsciously that I might lose it all and have nothing. And, you know, so I had to keep, I, I never had enough, mm -hmm. if you like. And how much of society is driven by that fear? Yeah. And the second fear is that I would never be, I wouldn't be loved. And that put, pushed me into relationships that weren't suitable for me because I was worried, well, if I don't grab this one, there won't be another one, if you like. And all subconscious, of course. But when I, what happened? I lost everything and I was, and I became unloved. And I faced the two fears that had driven me my whole life. My brain was able to say, well, you had those fears those things you've worried about but you're still here everything's fine so i could release those two mm. fears and allow my creative brain finally to say oh thank goodness for that liam you're out of the way now let me get on and do my job which it did and does beautiful it's so interesting isn't it and uh, my, you know my personal journey is, is is similar i actually ended up selling a business uh moving to nicaragua but then separating from my uh wife and I was like, oh, so now I don't have that family unit. I don't have the business. I don't have the status that I once had. Why am I even doing anything? You know, and and, and I, I had to really kind of search to to what what's the purpose of life? Because to me, it was providing for the family to, you know, look after the children and so on. And I was looking at my children and I was like, well, you know, we've 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 got life insurance, we've got you know, relatively wealthy uh, grandparents, so on. My wife is, you know, highly educated and a smart businesswoman. I was like, they don't even need me. And to me, that was so liberating. I was like, oh my God, mm. it doesn't, I don't have that fear, like you said, of providing for them. Mm. I don't have the fear of losing the family or the business because I that's all gone. And then I have a great relationship with my kids and a great relationship with my ex-wife, but it, it has allowed this this next level of my life to to evolve. And it sounds like that's the, yeah. the same process you went through. I just haven't haven't thought of it like you've thought of it before. But very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, well, the beauty is, isn't it, when you understand that you have this creative brain, whose sole purpose is to give you everything that you need to be happy. And, and when you've got everything you need to be happy, that's when you can give to others and be with mm -hmm. the right people and be loving and and, and hugely, um, you know, you contribute to the survival of the species, not only to yourself, but you, you have to understand that that's not your thinking brain and mm -hmm. it's not your survival brain. So it doesn't come from your thoughts. So sitting down, to, when you're in a state of stress, sitting down trying to figure out what you should do and use your thinking brain, it's just not going to work. So there's an element what we call might call faith or trust. And I don't think they're really faith or trust when you understand. It's like we live on faith. We live mm -hmm. on trust. We know the sun's going to rise tomorrow. We know we're going to breathe in the next instance. Our heart's going to beat. We know that cars are going coming towards us on the street are going to be on the opposite side. So we live on faith. And mm -hmm. why? Because we understand that that's the way those things work. And we have an experience to see them working. So we go, well, that's just how it works. But the problem is we've never been taught to let our creative brain take over so that we can have the experience to see that that's how it works. But once you start to, and you see people show up in your life, you no longer go, oh, wow, how did that happen? That's unbelievable. How did I meet that person? You don't say that anymore. You just go, that's the way it works. Fantastic. I wonder what miracles are going to show up today. Yeah. yeah. And that come, but as I say, once you have an, once you 
first steps to understand and say, yes, I, I get it that that's the way it's supposed to work. I'll do my bit and try and eliminate fear so that I can activate my creative brain. And then I'll start to get some experiences show up and then I can go, oh, wow, it's working. Great. I need to do more of this. Get rid of more of the fear. Get, and you look at, you know, get rid of all those things that are holding me back. And you hand it over to this, really, which is the infinite part of your brain. This create, it has access to infinite intelligence, infinite knowledge. Your thinking brain only has access to what you've experienced in your mm -hmm. life, which is a you know, minuscule amount compared to what knowledge actually exists. But your brain, your creative brain, knows everything about what you need and want. So you let it do its job. And that's the way we're supposed to live. That's the way all of nature lives, not with struggle, but with just going with the flow, doing what needs to be done and having a great time. Mm -hmm. having an adventure every day is an adventure and what, like like i say when you have that faith i think you summarize that very well in that that car coming towards you is going to be on the other side of the road and so we we take that for granted but tomorrow what's tomorrow going to be like is it going to be wonderful it will be it's the same as the car it's going to be on the other side of the road but we just don't have the faith or most people don't have the faith that it will be so they worry about it yeah, because we don't realize we're biologically designed to ensure that it will be good for us. Yeah, That's what our brain is trying to do in every moment, is make sure that, that it's great, that mm -hmm. our life experience is great. But we, it can't do that if you're stu stuck in the survival state that's shutting down all, the, all of that function and is just trying to, mm -hmm. to deal with it, you know, get rid of a, a lion out of your life. Mm -hmm. It's just the wrong, the wrong mechanism. And, you know, if you want to take the religious... Um, uh, analogy, you could say, well, God comes along, has given you a machine. He said to you, look, I want you to have the perfect life. I want you to have the, be the best that you can be. Here's the way to do it. Uh, this is what, what it is. You can't blame him if your life doesn't work out right because yeah. you're not using it the right way. Yeah. Particularly when it's been explained to you how to use it. Exactly. So, uh, we've been sold this idea that life's supposed to be a struggle and you have to work hard and you have to as you say, gather all these things in case, you know, prepare for your retirement or whatever right. it is. And this is just not biologically what we designed. But of course, it's great for the marketers and the people who want to control you because they can say, unless you do what I say, or unless you get what I suggest you get, you're not going to be happy. And when we're in a fear state, we believe it mm -hmm. because we, we don't feel happy. And if someone comes along with promises the answer, our fear-based brain will latch onto that. Again, it's a biological thing because we need to say if the the the, um, the tribe's coming over the hill about to kill our, everybody in our village, we need a leader to tell us what to do to organize ourselves, to defend ourselves against an attacker. So somebody stands up and says, everybody run that way. We all do because yeah. that's a, it's a biological survival mechanism when you're in that fear state. So you're very open to being directed by other people to unthinkingly do something that might otherwise be illogical. And of course, the military have used this throughout history. You know, you, they have to um, create fear to get people in, in their soldiers to do things they otherwise wouldn't do, like kill people and just act, act blindly on orders. It's mm -hmm. all created by fear. That's the mechanism of control. Mm. And but our mechanism of our own control is our creative brain. And that's where we're, we're actually in control of our life. And it's, and it's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Except when the lion comes. <laughs> I understand. So if a person wants to go further with this and they want to potentially uh, learn learn from you, how would they find you? And what sort of things do you do you offer? Well, my website, which is just my name, liamnaden.com, that's got mm. everything there. I've got a my own podcast called Using Your Brain for Success, where I go into a lot more detail, explain how your brain works and how to use it. I also have a coaching program where I teach neurostate rebalancing, which is really about understanding who you are and getting rid of all these fears and starting to live the way you're supposed to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really exciting. But every, everything's on my website, liamnaden.com. Mm. And can you give me an example of uh, like a client that would come to you? What state they're in and when they go through your program some things that have changed for them do you, do you have anyone that comes to mind uh yes quite, well quite a few people i do a lot of marriage and relationship coaching as well right. and um 
I've written, you know, most of the books I've written to date have been on on that subject because mm-hmm. it was the thing I started with. But I I've developed, if you like, more into it. Was one of the things that taught me more about this brain stuff because I couldn't understand when I coached people how sometimes some people got good results and others didn't. Yeah. And I saw the only difference was fear. It wasn't about motivation, knowledge, prayer, or anything like that, determination. It was the amount of fear they had. But I'll give you an example from that. Um, there was a gentleman recently who, his, he was a, an American guy, and he was a bit like I used to be, to go to the seminars. I will I will achieve any, I will succeed at any goal that yeah. I set myself. I must to prove that I'm a, I will unleash my, my brilliance and bust through all the struggles. His wife had been telling him for six years that she wanted a divorce. Mm. Sounds a and, bit bizarre. Right. But she had him around her little finger and said, Oh, I want a divorce. I want a divorce. And he was saying, no, we are going to, I'm going to fight for this marriage and, and I'm going to, you know, do whatever it takes. Well, he came to me and we realized, I helped him realize that all his motivation was based on fear. He was mm-hmm. afraid of being a failure, of appearing a failure, of he, yeah. him thinking he himself was a failure oh, and also of, you know, giving up. He was also afraid that he wouldn't find someone as good because he'd tell me how wonderful this woman was and how, how they used to get on. Yeah. really well so he, he had all this fear that was holding him stuck when he when he he worked well, and i helped him work through and get rid of these fears to realize someone telling you they want to want a divorce is no reason to be afraid you know that is not a lion about to eat you and someone you're not going to die here and now because someone mm-hmm. tells you they want a divorce so he turned around to his wife and said here are the divorce papers and he plonked them down in front of him and said sign there and she was shocked and he's and she said, what? And he said, well, you want a divorce? Right, we're having one. Yeah. So I think it started as a separation or whatever. Because he had overcome the fear and he realized this was crazy. It was keeping him stuck. And he could find someone far better. If Anyway, three months later, he didn't hear anything more from his wife for three months. And then right. she rang him up and she was in tears and said, look, I've been thinking about it. I miss you and you're right. And I want to go to counseling. I want to heal it. And he says, look, it's too late. It's over. And then, wow. when, then he went off, I think, and he was a, in a quite a corporate job. And he went off and um, and uh, set up a, um, a dive, uh, teaching diving somewhere, wow. something huh. completely different. And he, and he was far happier. Yeah. And it's the same, very much with you know, so many people I work with through in, in relationships where they've been stuck for you know thirty years, and they still keep thinking they can make it work. And when they finally let go of their fear, the right things happen. Sometimes their marriage works because they're a lot happier they're a lot more themselves and then their wife or husband who said i wanted to want a divorce because you're a miserable old so so and yeah. so now now they're back to being their happy great self so they're a lot more attractive so they can pat, heal their marriage or if it's the wrong marriage then they move on and they find someone better so the beauty is when you get unstuck from fear when you realize that that's holding you back your life turns out the way it's supposed to turn out which is a great in a great way very often most of the time not in the way you think it will Mm. it's not going to be the stuff on your goals list because your goals list is something you built on fear saying i need to have that for me to be happy or your thinking or your thinking brain created it out of only what you knew you let your creative brain get to work and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna shock you in a good way it is because the you know just i know we're probably running out of time but the thing is, we've all got this stuff in our body called DNA, and DNA is amazing. It's actually this strand of chemicals in every cell of our body, which if you were to stretch it out as 1.2 meters long in every cell of your body, mm. and we've got 75 trillion cells, you stretch out all the DNA in your body, and that's from here, it'll go from here to Mars and back five times. That's how much DNA, and all DNA is, is, is a... Is a collection of 250 million pieces of information about you you alone your it's your unique blueprint for who you are and your brain's job is to bring out the best of that blueprint is to yeah. find is to, it knows you don't know 250 million things about yourself but your creative brain does and its job is to take create whatever it can to express those 250 million pieces of information which are you in the best possible way so that's why you can never figure it out, as you say, with your thinking brain, which which you will if you're in a fear state. Mm-hmm. Your creative brain is just this incredible thing, but you have to understand that 
It's not you struggling that's going to make it work. It's you allowing. And sometimes, like it says in the matrix, you know, I can show you the door, but you're the one who has to walk through it. You've got to get over that step, which comes from understanding how your brain works to allow it to do its job. Beautiful. Just like you don't you don't get out of a car every five seconds and wonder wonder if you're still if it's still working. Yeah. You know, you don't check it. You just know it's it's going to do its job. Yeah. Liam, that was fascinating. I really enjoy listening to your your journey and your take on on take on it and talking about the neurostate rebalancing. Um, I think that's a great place to, to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much for having me here. All right. You take care. Bye bye. You too. I hope you enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. I thought Liam had a really interesting take on the different parts of the brain and how fear can overrule the thinking and the um, creative parts of the brain and can actually prevent us from leaving the life, leading the life that we want to live. If you like this podcast, really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel, wherever you get your podcast from, be that Apple or Stitcher, and also leave a review if you can. Five stars, ideally, but it's up to you. Leave a review, write something uh, nice, give me some feedback. And also you can always contact me if you want me to interview anyone in particular. Ed at edpaget.com is my email. So feel free to contact me. And if you want me to interview a certain guest, just say so.